so next up we have Katie Bell. Katie is a software developer for Grok Learning. Um, really interesting to highlight that she works mainly with teenagers um, and I don't think any of us can understand the full weight of how frustrating that must be. Um, so for her efforts and for being here, let's give her a round of applause. So the fun part of this is some of my former students are in this room, so put your hand up if you've been at NCSS. Yay, okay. Um, so annoying teenagers who are no longer annoying teenagers, hopefully. Okay, before I get started, um, you can tell where I, li I like this picture. I want to plug the NCSS challenge. If you know any students that is from grade five to 12 and is interested in learning Python, the NCSS challenge is starting on Monday. It is a five-week online programming competition. No prior experience required. Learn Python as you go. There is a block-based version of Python for the complete rookies. We're doing logo stuff this year, so you get to draw little pretty pictures of houses. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the NCSS challenge. I'm going to talk about the NCSS Summer School. So NCSS stands for National Computer Science School. We run both the programming competition in August, as in starting Monday, and we run a summer camp uh, in January uh, called the Summer School. This is run by Sydney University with the support of a bunch of sponsors who are all awesome. I'll get to that a bit later. Uh, the camp runs for 10 days, and we get about 100 high school kids from all over Australia and New Zealand, plus about 15 high school teachers, depending on the year. It is a fairly intense program for those 10 days. So we sort of start with a, a lecture at 9 a.m. in the morning. There's one hour lecture, three hours of lab time, one hour lecture, three hours of lab time. And then in the evening, we have evening activities until 10 p.m. So the kids are pretty much full on, except for meal times, um, right from 9 a.m. in the morning until 10 p.m. at night when we send them all to bed. This means that halfway through the camp, they're all a little bit dead. And so we have a sort of half a day off uh, usually on the Wednesday there. Um, and then the day after that, we spend a day visiting the offices of a bunch of the sponsors of the camp. So uh, last year, this was Google, Atlassian, and WiseTech, um, all great sponsors to get the kids to see what it's like to work in the industry. Um, but pretty much these last three days is what we have for the project time. So going into a little bit more detail about the tutorial time at the beginning, this is when we are teaching Python. So we get kids that come that have never programmed before, don't know anything, um, and this is the amount of time we have to get them to the point where they can start the project. Um, and we do that using the Grok Learning Interface uh, to teach them Python. Um, and so by the time we get to actually starting the project, we have only three days left in which to do it. Um, and this is the amount of time that we have. That last night there is an all-nighter which is fun. Okay. <laughs> um, though we chose this project because there are three different, in my experience, so we've been running, um, the NCSS summer camp has been running for 20 years now. It's been teaching Python for about 16 or 17 of those years. Um, so back from Python one point something. And um, we've been running the social networking site as a project as the main project for the last six years. And I've been involved in the last seven years. So before that, we did search engines. Apparently, search engines aren't cool anymore. It's all about social networking sites these days. Um, so we chose this project to build a completely functioning social networking site because these are the three things that I have found motivate kids to get excited about programming and about computer science. Different kids will have different combinations of these three things. But ultimately, you have kids that are really excited about learning how stuff works. The stuff that I use every day, how does it actually work on the inside, what goes into making it happen? Those kids get, get, that get really excited about building cool stuff, unless it looks like the things that they use every day, it's not cool enough. So making text appear on the screen, not very exciting, but building a site that I can then show off to my friends, that's exciting. And then there's kids that don't actually care about the other stuff. They care about the raw process of I have this problem and I need to break it down into steps and go through it and solve puzzles. That's kind of hard to avoid with programming, so we don't really need to care about that one. So the goal of the project is to get the kids to build a completely functioning social networking site 
but without giving them a bunch of tools that are just magic, that they don't understand how they work. There's no point having a function that's like, you run this function and boom, you have a website, because the kids don't learn anything that way. They don't learn how stuff works. Um, so the goal of this project is basically to get as much powerful, cool stuff at the end as we can, but still giving the kids the chance to learn how all of the steps fit together, how the process works underneath the hood. So the term social network is interpreted very loosely in this case. It's not, the first year we ran this, we had each of the four groups, um, each group has about 12 or 15 kids in it. Each of the four groups had a Facebook clone. The second year we ran it, um, we got a lot more interesting stuff. We encouraged the kids to really broadly interpret what the hell a social networking site could be. So we've had sites around planning group presence. This one is one of my favorites. It's a story building website where you can submit a word and vote on which word should come next in the story and hopefully eventually um, develop a coherent story, but probably not. Um, and a couple of other examples which we can go through later. We chose to use Tornado because it's fairly simple and lightweight. We've been using it for the last six years now. Um, but the problem is the sort of Hello World Tornado app is overly complicated. There's a lot of things on here that are confusing and scary. You have this kind of giant line of nested things for starting the I.O. Loop, loop at the bottom. Um, we have to define a class. We have only three days to teach Python. We don't actually get up to teaching classes. We skip over that. So that's just confusing for the kids that have never done classes. The whole concept of inheritance is confusing. Um, so we've written our own little tornado wrapper that makes things much, much simpler. Um, it is a very, very simple wrapper. Um, and it's just one line of Python. So, oh, so one file of Python that's um, uh, easy. So we have a fairly easy uh, little web server here. Um, all it does is say hello world when you go to uh, the index. Um, that's, yeah, I guess pretty straightforward. Um, here's an example with HTML. Before you complain at me, that is actually a valid HTML5 document. Um, and so it's a reasonably simple concept to understand that when I go to this URL, it calls this function, and the HTML that is returned, um, that is written to the response, is the HTML that shows up in the browser. There's a lot of concepts to get here where you have to understand this is a web server process running on your machine. It sends HTML back to the browser, and the browser displays it. Um, but that's pretty much as much magic as you get there. You're still seeing, okay, yes, the program is generating HTML, and now I see the result of that HTML in the browser. Of course, then you wanna do fancy things with logins and um, user profiles and stuff. So there's a bunch of fairly simple uh, functions to do things like cookies, to do things like form uh, fields from some form in the HTML that's then submitted, uh, and you can do things with that fairly simply. Um, I'm gonna flip over to a live demo, which is obviously gonna be risky. Um, no points for uh, web design here, sorry about that. Um, okay, so I have a little form. This is a tiny HTML form. You can say my username is Katie, uh, my full name is Katie Bell, and then I can submit my form, and it adds it to the user profile. I can add another one. I'm lazy, so I'm just gonna type. Um, how is this stored in the background? You think, well, I guess we have to go through databases and SQL or something like that in order to store things. No, actually we have a step before that, uh, if we can go to the next slide, where we teach the kids, um, first let's do a non-persistent database where we store everything in a giant dictionary as a global variable. Um, we found that trying to put in all of the different things, HTML forms, submitting things, as well as the database at the same time is a little bit too much too fast. Um, so storing stuff non-persistently uh, is a good way to get that sort of process of the information is flowing around, the information is being stored uh, without this kind of magic database thing uh, to confuse things. This of course means that if I kill this server and start it again, then everything's gone. So we wanna stop that. It's kind of hard to develop a good prototype. 
of a social networking site if you don't have a persistent database at all. Um, and we found the best way of doing a database is using SQLite. This has a lot of advantages that are reasonably obvious. It is powerful enough to do everything that we want it to do. It is mostly understandable. The, inter the API could be a little bit simpler. But you can actually see here is a physical file on my file system, and that is my database. If I delete that file, my database is gone. Um, that's much easier to understand than I have this process running in the background that's somehow serving my database from some other complicated API. And of course, it's built into Python, um, so that makes it nice and simple. Um, you can see here, the picture is from one of our NCSS projects uh, where we were planning out uh, the database structure and the series of tables that were required for that. And this is something that I thought would be a lot more difficult for the kids to pick up, but like understanding that I have a table of data and it's like a spreadsheet and foreign keys seems to be actually reasonably easy to grasp, which is good. Um, so that's pretty much all of the components of the websites that we use. We end up with very simple Tornado and very simple SQLite database, plug these things together, a bit of web design shininess on the front end, and you can have a functioning site. Of course, we get a huge variety of backgrounds of the kids that come to NCSS. We have kids that have never programmed before and kids that have been programming since they were eight and want to show off to the other kids how amazing they are at programming. Um, so we have a bunch of exciting extra projects for them. The most interesting of which is the template engine. So you can see how when you're doing the website, how if you're actually manually constructing your HTML in the Python code, that's going to get frustrating very quickly. I think it's important to get the kids to learn the hard way of doing things before we show them the magic easy way of doing things. So having a couple of the more advanced kids take time out from the project at the beginning to write their own Django templating engine gives them enough time for the other kids to understand what the HTML is doing. Then we say, okay, now let's use the templating engine. Um, and that makes the whole web development process much simpler actually using a Django templating engine. Um, this is a particularly fun project for the kids. They get to learn all about context-free grammars and parsing. Um, it's an interesting problem. I saw a talk yesterday about building a Django templating engine by building, uh, by essentially translating it in, into Python with the AST module. Um, that looks like a lot more fun. I think we might be doing that next year. Um, other extension projects that we do, uh, is we get kids to think about security and sort of safely storing passwords by hashing them. Um, sometimes we get kids to sort of build a layer around the database to uh, make it easier to find uh, the current user that's logged in in some kind of nice sort of ORM way. This tends to make things a little bit more magic for the other kids that are only just understanding SQL, so sometimes this has turned out to be bad for us, um, but it is a good exercise for the advanced kids. Often, depending on the particular social networking site that you're building, there's extra fun things that you can do. One year we had um, a site that was about for primary school kids to share what books they had been reading. So a couple of kids spent a while scraping Amazon to get a bunch of book cover pictures uh, to then fill up our SVN repo with. Um, and of course, you can add any little sort of JavaScript UI things for, again, for the more advanced kids. So, the other fun part of this is everything I have learned about project management, I have learned from running these projects at NCSS. Because when you have a uh, room full of kids who have, um, let's see if I can get rid of that. Nope, that's stuck there forever, okay. Um, when you have a room full of kids that have vastly different programming experience, and even the kids that have done a bunch of programming experience before, They've never worked in a large group, like doing a group project where you have 12 to 15 kids all working on the same thing is kind of crazy. None of the kids have done that before. They just don't have those team working skills. They don't understand testing. They don't understand that when they write the code, it doesn't necessarily work the way that they thought it was going to work. And they've never used version control before. And they don't know what an API is. They don't have an understanding that if I write this function, that it needs to be easy enough for other people to understand, and that I can't change that function without going through and checking if anyone is actually using that function anywhere. So having a stable API is not something that they even think about uh, when they're building their particular parts of the code. So we sort of need to teach them all of these concepts uh, as we go through, and it's, that's pretty fun. Um, we do use version control. That is something that we've learned the first time uh, back when we were still doing the search engine project, 
we didn't use version control, and I'm really glad we started using version control. Um, we have been using SVN the last six years. Last year was my first year using Git, and it turned into a horrible mess. Um, so I think we'll try Git again probably, but we're gonna be extraordinarily careful how we do that this year because we spent a lot of time resolving merge conflicts last year. Um, we find that in terms of coming up with the ideas for the project, it's important to have a big group discussion at the beginning so that all of the kids feel involved, all of the kids contribute ideas, all of the kids feel that sense of ownership over the project, but group decisions are really, really slow, so you wanna avoid doing that as much as possible. Um, using simple tools is really important. We did at some point experiment with using wikis and with using bug trackers. They turned out to be a complete waste of time when you have all of the kids in one room for three days. It's much, much easier to have a list of bugs on the whiteboard that you cross out when they're done um, than it is to use any kind of bug tracking system. It's much simpler. And of course, you have to tell the kids you, if you need to know how this part of the system works, you need to go over to Amy over there because she wrote that system and you need to ask her. You have to keep telling them to go talk to each other at least for the first couple of days and then they get the idea that they have to go talk to each other. Um, the other thing we've learned is to make sure that the site is working mostly, at least partially, at every point in time. You want to get something that is serving a web page right at the beginning and then go from there and constantly have something that is at least in some sense of the word working. Uh, what we do during NCSS is we have one of the tutors, uh, usually Tim, at least in the last couple of years, uh, who is the one that comes around to all of the groups at specific times and says, I'm going to be here at this time and I want to see a demo at this time. Okay, and so he'll write up on the whiteboard the time that he's coming and then as it gets closer to that time, the kids are frantically trying to fix things that are broken so that they have a working demo by the time he arrives. One year, the kids barricaded themselves in one of the computer labs so that he couldn't come in. Um, and we find that's a really good motivator. They get very excited when uh, the tutor comes and everything is working and he finds bugs and then they put the bugs on the whiteboard. It's a good process. Um, the other thing is when you introduce a new thing such as the templating engine or hey, now the database is ready to be used, you need to stop all of the kids and explain it to them all together and give them the chance to ask questions. We've sort of had a little bit of hit and miss with this in the past uh, when you, you don't wanna interrupt the kids when they're all working away happily um, and if you interrupt them too often, they're obviously not gonna get anything done but it does slow things down a lot if you have to keep explaining the same things over and over again, so it's also important to stop progress, let's all gather together, let's all learn about this new thing, let's get the same idea of where we're headed into everyone's head at the same time, so then we can go back and work and we're all working in the same direction with the same goals. And the other thing is, if anything does get working, you know that sort of yes moment where you click the web page and it does the right thing and it looks good, then you cheer, you gather everyone around to see it. They see that bit, yes, that bit of the site is working now, our site is making progress, it's very encouraging. So, some examples of sites that have come out in the last couple of years. Um, this was Opus, this was originally like a uh, progress pictures of a like hands-on project that you're working on, so the puppy pictures are just for a demonstration of where the pictures should go, but they're cute, so they're good. Um, so essentially showing progress pictures and sharing uh, what you're working on is a fairly loose interpretation of a social networking site. This one, I think it was originally called Forking Stories, but uh, changed its name to Word by Word uh, as you're building up stories with words and voting on which word and which path of the story is the one that you want to continue. Um, this one was a one about oops, um, sharing uh, enthusiasm for a particular fandom. So instead of just having a sort of Lord of the Rings movie fan site, it would be Lord of the Rings movie and the books and the Hobbit in some kind of fictional world. So you'd be able to group fandoms and enthusiasm around a, a fictional world in a different way to what everyone else is doing. Cloud Shelf, the name, is a, um, an example of why group decision making is a terrible idea. <laughs> Um, that was a very controversial decision and no one was happy with that name. So just to reiterate, this is the sort of core thing that I wanna get home. These are the things, these are the three different things that really get kids excited about learning programming and about learning computer science. Um, if you can cover all of these things, that's really awesome. 
right? You'll get a whole bunch of kids excited. It is very difficult to do this well because uh, the learning how stuff works and building cool stuff is often very much at odds with each other. How much magic versus how quickly can you get something impressive? Um, so we try and sort of balance these things. If you end up getting only one of these things for a particular group of kids, then that's also really cool because that will get some of those kids excited about programming. And the last plug for the NCSS challenge and also for teachers coming to NCSS the summer camp, if you know anyone that is a teacher, tell them about it. Um, we're very excited about that. Um, and we're also, yes, for the NCSS challenge, um, it is starting on Monday. If you know anyone that knows anyone that has kids in the grades five to 12 kind of range, then, uh, and you want them to learn to program, then uh, uh, go for that. Thank you. Okay, we've got some time for questions. Are there any questions? Yes, hello. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I guess my question is maybe a little bit silly, but mm -hmm. what have you kind of learned from working with kids or teenagers versus working with adults? Like, can you contrast your experiences and like, right. who's good at what and <laughs> sort of like how they differ? Um, there is a very different relationship like working with a group of kids and working with a group of ad adults. I mean, the only adults I've worked with have been professional software engineers who already know how to program and are being paid to be there and do their job and have been go through, gone through some kind of hiring process. Um, working with kids is a very different story because they're, um, there's, there's nothing kind of that they have, you have to deal with a whole different set of problems where they are very distracted by things. Like last year we had one kid that spent the whole time playing with Rubik's Cubes um, because it seemed to help him think somehow. It is very distracting talking to someone when they're like, Ch -ch 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 -ch. Um, <laughs> um, yep. So mostly just the, the complete lack of experience is the biggest thing that comes up. Like they don't know how to work together. They don't know the processes involved with software development. They don't know any of these things. They have to learn everything as they go. And at some point during this very intense camp, they occasionally they just burn out and they need a bit of a break before they can keep going. Um, I've never encountered that in the sort of, I mean, Burnout does happen in the software industry, but usually when you're working sort of very calm nine to five hours, and, um, and that doesn't happen quite so much as when you're halfway through an all-nighter and it's three o'clock in the morning and your site doesn't work and someone breaks down in tears. Um, it's, yeah, it's a very different environment. Does that answer your question? I'm not entirely sure. Like, it's a very broad question. There is a lot of differences between working with adults and working with teenagers, but a large part of that is the completely different environment that you're in. I think if we got a bunch of adults who are all completely new programmers doing exactly the same project with exactly the same time frame, um, it would be very similar to working with the teenagers, except that they would be a little bit more professional about it. Yep. Thank you, Katie. That was a fantastic talk. Um, the idea of specification and you know going through together and developing features and what the user stories are going to be, is that uh, covered at all in the things you do? Uh, so the idea of like actually planning out what are the requirements. Yes, yeah, so yeah, I didn't really cover that very much. Um, that kind of brainstorming session that we go through at the beginning where we come up with ideas for what kind of social networking site do we want to build. Uh, if I go all the way back to the schedule. Um, do, 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 too many slides. Um, this first project session over there um, that is that sort of three hour block. We don't do any code usually. That's all about planning what the project is gonna be. And the first thing we do is sort of building a whole ton of ideas. What are the possible things that we could do? We narrow it down to one kind of idea for what the social networking site should be about. And then we emphasize really strongly minimum viable product. What is the minimum set of things that we need to implement to have something that it works and fulfills our purpose? Um, so in that case, we come up with what is the minimum set of things that we need it, need it to do, and we do only those first. And often during the camp, we get only to that point where we just have a minimum viable product. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, where is the voice coming from? Yes, okay. Um, I have a nephew who I've always known he'd, he'd um, you know, be a programmer, but um, throughout his childhood, he just like, never really 
got it. Mm-hmm. And um, he did IT at school, and that bordered on criminal negligence. You know, like there was no mm. no programming at all. And um, the only good thing his IT teacher told him about was the NCSS. And ah. um, when he went there, it completely changed everything, and he absolutely loved it. What's his really name? Excited, uh, Sean uh, Ferguson. He was there last year. Yep, he wasn't in my group, but yes. Uh, okay. And um, and. Yeah, had a wonderful time, got really excited, and this year is he's in first year at Sydney University, and they've got him doing Java. What went wrong? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, interestingly enough, at Sydney University, there are two different intro to, intro to programming subjects. One of them is Java, the other one is Python. Um, so yeah, he could be doing both, yes. Yes, I learned Java in first year of university as well. Um, Yes, <laughs> that is a bit disappointing, but um, yeah. Um, thanks again. Uh, the, at the beginning, you mentioned that um, you have to have a project that the kids engage with because if it doesn't look like what they've got on a day-to-day basis, they just don't click with it. So that's why you. Well, that's to not necessarily networking. true, like, okay. and that's kind of the point of this. Like some kids, for some kids, that's really, really important. Right. Um, but for a lot of kids, they're happy building things that, that don't actually need to look like the things that they use every day. Right, okay. Yep. Well, I suppose for, for those kids in particular, but even mm. just more generally, your first demo is exactly what every first demo of a website looks like. It's HTML native rendering yep. of forms yep. that don't line up and all the rest of it. But by the end, it looks like you've got to something that's pretty polished. Yep. Are they learning these design skills as well as they go? Or are they being coached ah, on yep. what design is? Or, um, and it is the fact that the first thing they produce is but ugly. Does that... Uh, is that a disincentive to anybody, or is it just, hey, look, I've got something on the web page, and that is enough to get them going to the next bit? Gotcha. Um, that is a good question. So we do have, um, again, going back to the schedule, in the, the lecture times, um, as we get into the sort of project phase of the camp, the lectures split into different streams. So there is a introduction to HTML and CSS sort of web design lecture, and then after that there are both Python and web design lectures. And what we find is some of the kids by this stage are um, getting, as they get excited about the project, the thing that they're excited about is the web design aspect. And so we always get them to do a little bit of the coding, but often there'll be a couple of kids that almost entirely spend their time on the web design. We are lucky enough to have a bunch of the tutors who are, uh, a couple of the tutors, I would say, I should say, (laughs) there's not enough of them, um, who are professional web designers who go around to all of the groups and help the kids make these really nice polished designs. Um, That being said, we did not have any particularly good web designers in my group last year, and this is the site that we ended up with. Um, It works, but it's very clearly not particularly shiny. Um, And yes, again, this is something that matters for some kids and more than others, and there's usually at least a couple of kids that are very excited about the web design, even if they're not particularly good at it. They really liked it. They were really excited about like the color scheme and everything. This game, this is pretty fun. Does anyone know the answer to this? <laughs> it's actually not Python, no. Oh, constrictor. You guys are good. So this was the project that my group made uh, last year. Yep. So yes, yeah, so you can see the web design is not there, but um, we do, yeah I, yeah, I didn't really cover that in the talk, but because I tend to stay away from the web design because that is not my thing. Um, but uh, yeah, there is a series of talks that go through good design principles, constructing a wireframe, choice of colors, that kind of stuff. Um, we, yeah, we are lucky enough to have a professional web designer who goes, who does those lectures. Yep. Uh, oh. Maybe. Yeah, me, at the back, the AV person. Sure. Um, you said that there's a huge range of abilities and previous experience and stuff. Mm-hmm. How, so, programmers can be arrogant, and I've never found that being a teenager particularly <laughs> helps with that. Yes, <laughs> yes, this is extraordinarily true. How yep. do you deal with people who are not as confident, like being in awe of people who have much more experience and so on? How do you deal with that sort of stuff? That is a really difficult problem to deal with. Um, This was something that I experienced when I started university. So I went to an all-girls school, and there was not a lot of people there who were like hardcore programmers. And I was, I thought, like at the point where I left school, that I'm like, I'm like amazing at programming. I'm so good. I know everything. And then I went to university, and like we started learning Java, and I'd never dealt with object-oriented stuff before. So I'm like trying to 
understand everything, and the person sitting next to me is like, why are we learning Java? I already know Java. Um, and he was also like working part-time as a software developer, and like, I'm like, maybe I shouldn't be doing computer science because clearly I'm really behind. Um, so I understand this problem, yes, and it is daunting, especially for the kids that come from a school where they are, they are the computer genius and they come to NCSS and there are these amazing kids that have already got a lot of experience that are always trying to show off to each other. Um, a lot of that is the tutors get really involved in, in, in developing uh, a culture where everyone is encouraged to learn and push themselves and it's important to get the kids to participate and contribute to the project together um, rather than there are always some kids that are like, I don't know anything, I clearly can't contribute, give me something that's not important. And we say, uh, no, you're gonna work on this part of the system, this is the core part of the sort of user profile page, you need to do this, I will sit here and help you. So we're very lucky to have a tutor to student ratio of about one to four, sometimes even one to three-ish, somewhere in the middle. Um, so we do actually have enough tutors so that if someone is really struggling, they can have someone sit with them and go through stuff. Um, so uh, that gives us a real advantage in keeping everyone uh, moving and keeping everyone engaged in learning. Um, it is a problem that they see other people who are clearly way ahead of them, and there's no real way to avoid that, but we try and encourage, that is because they have been doing this for a long time, you can get to that point too, it's actually not that hard to catch up. I have spent many in NCSS over lunchtime, over dinner, talking to the students about my own experience of being completely intimidated and then catching up over a period of years. Yeah. Do you do any incursions into schools and teach within the classroom environment? Um, yes and no. So I've been involved in a couple of things that are fairly separate to NCSS where I've gone into schools and run workshops. Um, and stuff. It is a very different environment when you're in a school with a class of students that don't necessarily want to be there, unlike NCSS where they have willingly given up their holidays to be there. Um, and you, you need to be a little bit more careful and be a little bit more hand-holdy and, and take things at a slower pace in that case. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't had a lot of experience of classroom teaching. Okay, we'll have to leave it there with questions because lunchtime is starting and people are going to start storming through this room. Um, we've got a token of appreciation. Thank you. That's okay. Uh, let's give it up one more time for Katie.